Hey everybody, it's your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are going to be continuing our video series on the AP Biology Science Practices by discussing AP Biology Science Practice 3. Um, and as you recall, if you've watched the other two videos, the science practices in the AP Biology exam are the things that you have to be able to do um, with the content knowledge that you get from topics 1.1 through 8.7, right? So that's all the content knowledge. Science practices are about what the AP exam is going to be asking you to be able to do with that. All right. And uh, science practice three is all about questions and methods um, and determine scientific questions and methods. Right. So this is really a, um, about the base level ideas of what science is about. Um, it's particularly like having, you know, experiments and studies, which is the basis of science. Right. Um, so what we're going to get into today is no, we're not going to do all of science practice three today. We're going to do science practice 3.A, 3.B. And uh, actually, that's it. All right, so we'll get to A and B, and then in our next video, we are going to get into C, D, and E. But if I go back to A and B here, this is what we're talking about. Um, th skill 3.A is asking you to, to identify and pose a testable question based on an observation, data, or a model. And 3.B is asking you to state the null and alternative hypotheses or predict the results of an experiment. Okay, so this is all lab practical type stuff. Um, and hopefully over the course of your AP Biology, well, course, um, over the year that you're taking this class, you will have done a, a bunch of this many, many times um, because this is a lab-based course and you should be doing labs with your instructor um, and you should have some experience with this because, you know, what good is taking a science class if you're not actually doing science, all right? And this is the basis of science. But um, as a recap here, I thought it would be helpful to make a video um, helpful to make a video about, you know, what are these hypotheses and just get to the bare, the bare bones of uh, these skills here. All right, so we'll start with 3.A. Um, that's identify and pose a testable question based on an observation, data, or a model. Okay, so anything in science, uh, science is the way that we figure out things about the natural world, right? That's my, sim my favorite definition. That's the simplest way I can put it. It's how we learn stuff um, about the natural world, okay? And how that begins is always with a question. Why does this work the way it does? What is that? What happens if I do this? Um, and based off of those questions that we ask, we formulate a hypothesis. Okay? And the hypothesis it literally translates from Greek to foundation. Okay? So the foundation of any scientific study or any experiment is a hypothesis. And what is that? You've probably heard it before. I hope you've heard it before if you're taking AP Biology. Um, it's a testable explanation for a set of observations based on available data guided by inductive reasoning. All right, so it's based, it's so um, a lot of times I hear the definition of a hypothesis being an educated guess, which is a little vague, but it's kind of, kind of getting to what a hypothesis is. Uh, but there's a few things about a hypothesis that are going to be important, and I'm going to point them out in this definition. They have to be testable, right? A hypothesis is not a hypothesis unless you can design an experiment around it and you can test that hypothesis. You can show whether it's uh, incorrect or correct. You can accept it or reject it based on what you find in your study. Um, and it's based on available data. Um, so it's limited in scope. A theory is much broader in scope. A, a hypothesis is limited in scope and it's based on inductive reasoning, right? So inductive reasoning is like, hmm, if this is true, then this must be true. Um, so it's kind of like, like I said before, a little bit like an educated guess, but it has to be testable and it is limited in scope, okay? Um, so that's what a hypothesis is, right? And uh, asking a question, as I said, all right, uh, figuring out something, how, how it works in the natural world always begins with a question. Asking a question leads to a hypothesis, and these hypotheses serve as the starting point for an investigation. Um, and as I said before, every scientific study begins with one, which is the foundation of the ed experiment, right? So hopefully you've looked at the scientific method in like seventh grade or something like that. Um, you start with an observation or a question, your research, you... Um, come up with your hypothesis, you test it, you analyze your data, and you report your conclusions. You know, this is grade, seventh grade, you know, scientific method, um, and it's the basis of all, all science, right? And AP Biology is no exception. You got to know this stuff um, in order to, uh, to succeed on the AP Biology exam, as this is, you know, supposed to be a college-level class. Um, and like I said before, hypotheses must be testable. Right. So, uh, so one of the questions here that it's going to be asking you is like, what is a question that you could ask based on the, these data? Um, what's a hypothesis you could make based on these data? Um, all right. So uh, it's I know it's a little small. I apologize for that. Hey, okay, but we have a model of uh, CFTR here. 
um, which is, well, it's a chloride ion channel on the surface of epithelial cells, okay? So it says cystic fibrosis is a recessively inherited disorder that results from a mutation in the gene encoding CFTR chloride ion channels located on the surface of many epithelial cells. As shown in the figure, the mutation prevents the normal movement of chloride ions from the cytosol to the cell, uh, of the cell to the extracellular fluid. As a consequence of the mutation, the mucus layer that is normally present on the surface of the cells becomes exceptionally dehydrated and viscous. An answer to the, which of the following questions would provide the most information about this association between the CFTR mutation and the viscous mucus. All right, so do you have to know about um, cystic fibrosis in order to answer this question? Do you have to know what CFTR is like beforehand before you read this question? Do you have to know what that is for the AP biology exam? No, but what you should be able to do is figure out, okay, based on based on these observations, what's a question I can ask? All right, so that's what this is asking you to do. Um, so if you want to pause the video, try this for yourself, go for it. Go for it. Um, and then I'll talk about the answer here in a second. All right, so A, B, C, or D, which is the following... Uh, which of the following is the best question that fits the scenario? And the answer would be C. How does the mutation alter the structure of the CFTR protein? All right, so structure, that's a big theme of biology. Stru structure serves function. The way something is built or the way something is structured allows it to carry out its function, right? So asking about the structure of the CFTR protein um, as a result of a mutation, that would be a good question to ask as to um, how this affects, or how cystic fibrosis affects the uh, vis viscous mucus, right? Because that's what happens during uh, cystic fibrosis. All right, uh, so three point B. All right, three point A is all about, you know, asking a question or making a hypothesis. And that question right there was all about, all right, what would be the question that could fit this, uh, this study or what could we base the study off of? Um, three point B asks you to state the null in alternative hypotheses or predict the results of an experiment. Okay, so this is, uh, again, in asking you to do some inductive reasoning, but you also need to know what the null and alternative hypotheses are. Okay, so we talked about hypotheses just now as being testable predictions uh, based on limited data and used, guided by inductive reasoning. Hey, there's two different kinds of hypotheses, though. All right, and one of them is called the null hypothesis. Um, and the hypothesis that... Um, what that is, is the hypothesis that assumes there is no significant relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable in the study. All right, so in our next video, we're going to talk more detail about the independent variable versus the dependent variable. But um, for right now, we can just say the independent variable in an experiment is what's being tested or what's being manipulated or controlled, um, while the dependent variable is what you measure um, in respect to change in the independent variable. Okay, so like... It, this example right over here. Um, if I have two plants, I plant um, or I water one with distilled water um, and I water one with mineral water. All right, the independent variable in this case would be the type of water. I'm testing the type of water um, on, and then how I'm going to, what I'm going to measure is the plant's growth, right? How much is the plant going to grow in response to the type of water, right? So the dependent variable would be the, the growth of the plant, the independent variable would be the type of water, all right? So if I'm making a null hypothesis, Okay, I would say that there is no relationship between the type of water and the growth of the plant. Or in other words, the type of water does not affect the plant, uh, the growth of the plant. Okay, or there is no statistical relationship between the two. Okay, um, we're going to be getting into the statistics here once we uh, get into, I think that's science practice four. All right, we'll talk more about the statistics, but something that you should know. When is the null hypothesis true? When can you tell that there is no relationship between the independent and dependent variable? Okay, uh, first of all, if you're seeing no difference in the growth of these plants, then you could probably accept the null hypothesis. There's the mineral water and the distilled water. The type of water does not affect how much the plant grows. Okay, but here's the thing. You have to be able to statistically show that um, in order to accept the null hypothesis as being true. Okay, and one way to do that is by investigating error bars. And we're going to talk about how to make error bars here in an upcoming video. Okay, but if error bars overlap, meaning that I, here's, my, here's my bar graph, okay, and uh, error bars are calculated using standard deviation and standard error of the mean, uh, which will, again, will we'll come over soon, you know, we'll, we'll go over soon. Um, if they are overlapping each other like these ones are, then there is no significant relationship between these three data points. Okay, so that means that the calcium sensitivity um, between phosphate, oxalate, and uric acid, um, there's no real difference between the calcium sensitivity of those three. We can't, we can't show it statistically. Okay, so that means in this scenario, all right, if I'm testing uh, the, the matrix, the main matrix, um, 
and I'm measuring how much calcium sensitivity each of these has, all right, I would accept the null hypothesis. There is no relationship between these two variables, all right? So as I put overlapping error bars indicate that there is no statistically significant difference between groups or variables. And you accept the null hypothesis. You, you say, all right, this is true when what's being tested has no effect on what's being measured, like we just talked about before. So, all right, so with the plants, again, you accept the null hypothesis if there's, the, there's no difference in the plant growth um, and you water them with two different types of water. Okay. Um, the other time that you would accept a null hypothesis is if the calculated chi-square value, again, we're going to do chi-square value in an upcoming video, does not exceed the value in the, the critical value in the table. That's when you would accept the null hypothesis. All right. So check it out. If I, or we're going to do this again later. All right. So um, if you come up with a chi-square value of 4.3, all right, and the degrees of freedom that you have in your experiment is equal to two. All right, check it out. My calculated value is 4.3. The critical value um, for uh, 0 0.05 p-value okay, would be 5.991. Since 4.3 is less than 5.991, all right, I cannot statistically say that there is a difference between my independent and dependent variable, and in this scenario, I would accept the null hypothesis. Again, this will make more sense once we do a chi-square analysis together. We're going to come back to the null hypothesis, all right? But main thing is that if there's no relationship between the independent variable, what you're testing and what you're measuring, then you accept the null hypothesis, okay? The data is not significant. Um, all right, so then you also have to know what the alternative hypothesis is, and it's the opposite of the null hypothesis, right? So the alternative hypothesis assumes that there is a relationship between your independent and dependent variable, or does the independent variable, or the independent variable does have an effect on the dependent. Okay, so here's another plant growth um, example. If I am measuring the effect of biofertilizer on plant growth, um, check it out. If on my, here's a null hypothesis that I might make, um, before the beginning of the experiment, I'm going to say fertilizer X does not affect plant growth. And then my alternative hypothesis would be, okay, biofertilizer does accept plant growth. Okay. So if I'm, uh, if I'm measuring, uh, if I'm creating an experiment where I'm measuring the effect of the fertilizer on plant growth and the plants grow with more fertilizer, then I'm going to reject the null hypothesis and I'm going to accept the alternative because there was some kind of relationship. The independent variable does have some kind of effect on the dependent variable. All right. Um, so here's when in, the, in that scenario that we just talked about before, the statistically significant. All right. You accept the alternative, the, the fact that the independent does have an effect on the dependent variable. If the error bars do not overlap, okay, if you got error bars on a graph and they're um, they, they're not overlapping each other like these ones are, okay? There's a whole bunch of space in between these that they're, they're overlapping, okay? This would be, this graph right here, we would accept the null. But if they're not overlapping, you accept the alternative, all right? And then if, say, my chi-square value that I calculated before was like 10.4 or something like that, is that bigger than the critical value in the table? Yes, it is. And I would say that there is a statistically significant relationship between the independent and dependent, meaning the independent does have an effect on the dependent. All right, what I'm testing does have an effect on what I'm measuring. All right, I cannot stress that enough, um, that that's what, this is what science is all about, everybody. All right, so here's some questions, then we'll wrap up this video. Um, a respirometer is a container used to measure the amount of oxygen consumed by an organism. A respirometer was used to determine how environmental temperature affects the uptake of oxygen in one 300-gram rat and one 50-gram mouse. The results of the experiment are shown on the graph below. Which of the following hypotheses is best supported by the results of the experiment? Okay, so this time you got to read the graph and then um, figure out what the hypothesis is that would be accepted um, based on the data. All right, so take a second, pause the video if you want to try it yourself. I'm going to move on, and there it is. A, metabolic rate per gram of tissue is higher in smaller mammals. All right, so you got to take a look at the graph over here. Um, look, this is the relative amount of oxygen consumed. That's indicated by a higher metabolic rate. And the mouse, clearly at both temperatures, has a higher metabolic rate than the rat. Okay, so that is a hypothesis that would be supported by the data. All right, so you would accept that hypothesis. You would reject the other ones. Okay, um, in our next video, we will talk about controls and independent and dependent variables. We'll talk more about that, um, a negative control, positive control, that kind of stuff. All right, um, have a good day, and we'll see you next time.